Friends, today we celebrate the most memorable event in human history, the day when the light of eternal life penetrated the tomb and set the captive free. For he is not dead, he is risen. All of us have loved ones who during the last year have left this world. And Jesus said, In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And St. Paul said, There are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is both a natural body and a spiritual body. When the disciples of Jesus asked him, what is God's relationship to the dead? Jesus answered by saying, he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. In other words, Jesus was saying, God is life, and life cannot produce death. God is love and peace and joy, and God is right where you are, not only in this world, but in another world which is as real as this one. As wonderful as were the words, and the works of Jesus, the miracles of love and compassion which he performed, the great climax of his whole mission was the proof that the spirit of man is immortal. Jesus plainly taught that the kingdom of God is at hand, here and now, that divine love can protect us here and now and that divine guidance can lead us here and now. Jesus also taught that what we really are will live forever. His teaching would have been incomplete unless this were true. It was the triumph of the Spirit that he demonstrated, the complete emancipation of man from the limitation of the flesh, and it is this triumph of the Spirit that we celebrate today. But Jesus was not talking of himself alone. Perhaps the real reason why he raised Lazarus from the dead to be followed by his own triumph was to show us that all men are immortal, not just some men because of their particular belief, but all men. This is why he said to the thief who died with him on another cross, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Real immortality means that you and I shall not only continue to live after this life, but that we shall continue to be the same individuals we now are retaining everything that makes for the warmth and the color of this human personality. That means that we shall carry our entire consciousness with us, the ability to know and to be known, to see and to be seen, and to commune with each other. This is why Jesus showed himself to so many persons after he had left the tomb forever behind him. And I wonder if sometimes we haven't been just a little too morbid about the thought of death. To Jesus, death was the triumphant procession of the soul, the ongoing of the spirit, and the expansion of the mind. He knew that this is not the only life or the only world or he would never have said, in my father's house there are many mansions. And who can doubt but that Jesus, who so definitely forgave people, was trying to show us that everyone 
will finally arrive at the same goal. Perhaps we have yet to learn that there is but one race, which is the human race, one family which is the family of God, and one God who is the God of everyone. And I often wonder just what would happen if this were a firm conviction in our mind. Would we not be more tolerant of each other's mistakes? And would we not be more forgiving? Would we not come to realize that this life, after all, is but a temporary thing in a vast and an eternal expansion of the soul? What would be your reaction and my reaction if we knew that the only thing we can take along with us when we leave this world will be what we really are? Would not our very possessions seem of less value to us? Should we not come to realize that the only things that are worthwhile are those things that cannot change? And above everything else, would we not come to live as though we were immortal beings right now? We should know that our friends who have left this world have gone into another world to which we someday shall go to, to become reunited with all those where the natural and logical affinity of attraction draws us. Just to going on into a fuller life, into a greater activity and a more complete self-expression. Perhaps this is why Jesus, on one rare occasion, took some of his followers into a secluded spot and permitted them to commune with others who had passed on. Immortality means that our entire personality shall possess beyond the grave. In this world, we associate our personality pretty much with what we call the five physical senses, plus that subtle, that indefinable something which we call the mind, the consciousness, or the spirit. Now the realist might ask, what evidence do we have that these qualities will really possess? And so let's see. Biology is the study of the physical organism, the life principle that makes it work. But has anyone ever seen this life principle? Does anyone know what it looks like? You cannot weigh it or measure it. And yet no one doubts that it is there. It is as simple as this. I know I am alive. And yet all the biologists in the world do not know just what my life is. Well, psychology is a study of our mental and our emotional reactions. And yet all the psychologists put together haven't the slightest doubt what the mind is, haven't the slightest idea what the mind is. Physics is a study of energy, yet no physicist can tell us what energy is, or what it looks like. And so here we are, living in this world with almost no knowledge of what we are. Yet to deny our existence would be utter absurdity. And this was what Jesus was trying to tell us. He was trying to get us acquainted with the fact that we are spirits right now, just as much as we ever shall be. It is this spirit, this mind, this consciousness, this invisible thing about us that persists after we have left this world. Perhaps one of the most interesting things that has happened in the last 20 years is the demonstration in a psychological laboratory that even while we are in this world, under certain conditions, we are able to reproduce all the activities of the physical senses without ever using the organs of the sense. If you knew there is something about you that can see and hear, 
something that can communicate and travel and exist independently of this physical body even while you are in this world. Don't you think this would be sufficient evidence that God has put something in you that is as eternal as his own being? I think it would. And here is the thought I love very much above other things that Jesus said. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You and I have never done anything to earn this kingdom. It is the gift of life. You and I cannot believe, we dare not believe, that we could do anything to destroy this kingdom. We may be able to delay the day of emancipation. We may be able to deny the reality of our own spirits because we are individuals. But surely, that which God has made, you and I cannot destroy. All our actions are drawn from an invisible source, and the real personality is never seen. It is only felt. We feel the contact of each other. We commune with each other. Yet all we see in this physical and objective world is but a copy of something that is invisible. For no artist has ever seen beauty, he feels it. No lover has ever seen love, he realizes it. No mathematician has seen the principle of mathematics, but he uses it. At the very center of every object, and at the center of every personality, there is a spiritual presence which makes itself known. It is no wonder that Jesus said it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, to give you the kingdom of the self and the kingdom of God, which Jesus said are one and the same. Why then should we wait to become immortal? The Apostle John said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. He didn't say, By and by we are going to become sons of God. He said, We are that now, today, this moment. Now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And now suppose we transpose this into our own language, and if so, we would be saying, Beloved, you are a spirit already. You are the Son of God today. And while it doesn't quite appear this way, when he shall appear, that is, when we shall know ourselves as we really are, we shall be like him. We shall discover that we are spirits now in the kingdom of God. We know that we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In other words, when he, which is the spirit within us, or the Christ, shall appear, and when we see him as he really is, we shall know that we are like him. We shall understand that we are one with him forever. And all our longing, all our yearning will pass into the certainty of actual experience. It is this thing that we really are that is immortal. For as Jesus said, flesh and blood do not enter into that kingdom which is beyond this world. Flesh and blood belong to this earth. And when for any reason this physical body is no longer a fit instrument for the soul, then the spirit severs itself from this body. For never the spirit was born. 
the spirit shall cease to be never. Never was time, it was not. End and beginning are dreams, birthless and deathless and changeless. Remaineth the spirit forever. Death hath not touched it at all. Dead, though the house of it seems. Life is an eternal progression, never less, but always more itself. But you and I are human beings, and we all miss those whom we have loved. We all do long for the touch of a vanished hand, of the sound of a voice that is stilled. But even in the moment of grief, there is no despair, for we know that our friends have passed on to a greater, a deeper, and a fuller life. They have carried everything that makes for the warmth and color of human personality. And God can make no mistakes. This is right, or it would not be so. There is something about us that is limitless, triumphant and eternal, and it will not suffer beyond a certain point or be restricted beyond certain limitations. Its very nature causes it to break the bonds of the flesh, only to find itself emerging in the sunrise of a new day. As Longfellow said, he is gone, the sweet musician, he the sweetest of all singers, he has gone from us forever. He has gone a little nearer to the maker of all music, to the master of all singing. And so let us say of our friends, our friends who have gone from this world, leaving behind them the atmosphere of their presence, which, like sweet rosemary, lingers with us for remembrance, let us say, they have but drawn closer to the eternal light and laughter of love. And today, they walk in the garden of God and walk back to us a kiss from the kingdom of heaven. the kingdom and the power and the glory 